Hi, I'm Ann Rieselbach, the Architecture League's Program Director, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture by Emmanuel Pratt, Reconstructing Public Trust, Reframing Past, Present, and Future. But before we begin, on behalf of the League, some thanks are in order. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. The Architectural League additionally thanks its members whose support helps make possible this and other programs and the Cooper Union's Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture. In ordinary times, we would be gathered together in their great hall to hear this lecture. This past year, they have virtually co-hosted the League's current work series, which spotlights new and recent work by leading architects and designers, engineers and architects worldwide. You can preview upcoming programs and view videos of past lectures on archleague.org. This season's series is topically linked by the overarching theme, Reckoning, Reclamation, and Regeneration. Speakers have and will examine some of the inherited histories, conventions, fabrics, and systems that constitute and shape the built environment, asking how we might reconsider the ways we engage with and construct the places that surround us. Some of the myriad issues this encompasses include transforming architectural pedagogy, protecting threatened historic sites, conserving resources by adapting existing buildings and reusing materials, and reimagining and regenerating places scarred by racism, neglect, and environmental emergencies, or in the case of tonight's speaker, Emmanuel Pratt of the Sweetwater Foundation, all of the above. Today's program will be moderated by Casey Jones, a Chicago-based principal at Perkins and Will, where he directs the firm's Design Leadership Council. Formerly, Casey led design and construction programs at the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Overseas Building Operations and the U.S. General Service Administration's Public Building Service. Earlier in his career, he was the Associate Director of the Van Allen Institute and is a fellow of the Design Trust for Public Space, where he teamed with Friends of the High Line to produce Reclaiming the High Line, the study that advocated for the reuse of the then derelict rail line on Manhattan's west side. We're looking forward to their conversation following the lecture, which to paraphrase a recent conversation with Casey, brings the perspective of two design advocates working to change the system. Casey from within by dismantling and rebuilding things in a manual by providing an alternative model altogether. We would also like to encourage questions from the audience following the conversation, following the presentation, which can be posted in the Q&A section, not the chat, the Q&A section during the conversation. And now I will turn it over to Casey to introduce Emmanuel. Great, thanks, Sam. Um, I'd like to start tonight's event first by thanking the Architectural League for bringing Emmanuel Pratt and me together. Um, providing us the opportunity to get to know one another. Um, Emmanuel is someone that I've had enormous respect um, and long admiration for, and having the opportunity to meet and actually go down to the Sweetwater Foundation as part of this um, event uh, was uh, something that um, I think uh, started, uh, started what will be a much longer conversation between the two of us. Um, Emmanuel Pratt is trained as an architect and an urban designer, but I would argue he's really a polymath, equally comfortable discussing economic theory, ecology, history, and a range of other topics that he moves between seamlessly, uh, even in casual conversation. The co-founder and executive director of the Sweetwater Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization based on Chicago's South Side, Pratt is literally redefining urbanism from the inside out. Sweetwater engages the residents of neighborhoods that have suffered the effects of long-term disinvestment and engages them in the cultivation and regeneration of social, environmental, and economic resources, thereby growing community through a process called regenerative neighborhood development. Emmanuel received a Bachelor's of Architecture from Cornell University and a Master's of Science in Architecture and Urban Design from Columbia. He's taught at Chicago State University, where he was the Director of Aquaponics. 
the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan as the Charles Moore Visiting Professor, and most recently at the University of Chicago. In 2016, he was named a Loeb Fellow at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. And in 2019, he received both a MacArthur Fellowship and a Joyce Award. Please welcome Emmanuel Pratt. Thank you, Casey. Um, <clears throat> please uh, just everyone let me know that you can hear me speaking into this volume of space. Yes. All right, great. Um, so I, it was an interesting encounter uh, first um, with Anne just being asked to do the talk. Um, and then being introduced to Casey, just trying to have an opportunity to think and reflect. And um, the, the topic resonates on so many levels. And it, it has caused me to do a bit of an introspection. So every time I have one of these, I use it as a proper opportunity to think and reflect. So I will share my screen, make sure. <clears throat> Good. Great. All right, thank you. So um, for this topic, I wanted to focus on the concept of reconstructing public trust. There's been a lot of discussions, um, actually post uh, 2016 with the shift in the administration about the notion of a new reconstruction moment. Um, and there's actually a lot of discussion that, what is reconstruction and should it even be what what should you reconstruct or should it even have been built in the first place um so in order to deal with public trust i wanted to set some parameters first what is public um i always do these just to ground the conversation and really root it into what we're discussing so public um there's two different options there's open general open to the uh, to the general public, people, populace as a whole, um, and ultimately how that relates to the interface with government and governance. There's a multiplicity of publics um, that don't always mix very well when it becomes a private, public-private hybrid opportunity. Um, in the frame and structures of society, we have to think through and reevaluate where we're at with trust. Um, there have been communities for generations that have had no reason to trust, rightfully so. Um, the notion of who to trust, how to trust, uh, what is trust? Is it hope? Is it an actual inheritance? Is it a fund? Um, what supports the trust? And unfortunately, majority of this has been, um, but we're stuck in the complexities right now that have challenged how we think about rationality. And uh, the way that humans work, there's a complexity of our brains that processes information as a bounded rationality. This is normal when you're dealing with complex thinking. So you have a cognitive capacity of humans, and you have information variability, time constraints, how can I process all of it? Is there a relationship in a relationship? But then there's the notion of satisficing. How, you know, you, what, what, what will suffice? What's good enough? And it always leads to some form of a suboptimal decision. If you are not aware, you should take some time to refresh and learn about public choice theory. Public choice theory is actually an economic based theory about how to deal with publics and governance in the political sphere um, and its influence heavily in influencing continually influencing the notion of public economics. Which then influences public finance. Which ultimately informs our public policy. And the challenge with public policy and the public in an economic framework where 99 cents will always lose to a dollar, 
and the fastest return on investment with a single bottom line framework is that it frames the notion of a public good completely different than if you have a different timeline. It's a mathemat mathematical framework that starts to lose the notion of a human infrastructure or ecological infrastructure a sense of time. So the public good then gets framed against an externality externalities of the cost of development. There's good cost of development and it's you know bad cost of development. And ultimately whatever stands in the way of the cost of development is in the way. So it, all, it comes back to this notion of question of value. How do you value what is valued? Is it money and monetary only or is it principle and ethics morality? Cities are living organisms that are you've constantly ever evolving with the notion of a bounded rationality to change per decade, especially as we're experiencing right now with this, this unfolding of every single possible reform that needs to be questioned, re-questioned, re-evaluated, everything. So cities by design are being reflected upon as they should. This is a critical moment in our history of the evolution of cities. So I'm calling from uh, Chicago, which is an amazing city. Um, it has its all forms of challenges. It has all types of opportunities. Um, it is oftentimes pictured in this picturesque photo kind of way that is the physical manifestations of capital that are in the built environment directly adjacent to the water. And then it's pro projected uh, with this balance of abstraction and representation. How do we use our tools? This is just some images from searches of renderings of images of Chicago proposals. How do you use your tool to carve and form some level, level of legibility that then conveys some essence of development or projection of development, but then who is it for and what happens to the other side that doesn't get the support. So just like in every city, not just Chicago, every city, there is a tale of two cities and landscapes of uneven development that reify structures of inclusion, not just in the built environment, but the actual physical structures. And they're also often reinforced by the mental structures, the implicit biases that play out across race, race, class, and space over time. There's a spatio-temporal lens to how the built environment changes. In this case, this is abuse of public housing directly adjacent to where downtown but over time with stereotypes, you have concepts of food deserts that emerge. And then there is a structural determinant of life expectancy based on what people are saying by where you live, where your zip code, where, you, where are you employed or unemployed? Your choices of life are bounded by some form of rationality that is sort of part of a structural systemic process. So this term of blight, uh, if you've seen any of the talks before, I have referenced it a lot because it, 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 it was actually a study of plants and the ecology and the death and decay of a crop so that it no longer sustains life, but it was applied mathematically, economically to justify expenses to support paths path, path and patterns of development. Um, so in the case of public housing, the story that is commonly told and seen is the d demolition and erasure, and it's a pretty violent process. Um, and it, if to question what is happening with the materials, the, the water that's sprayed constantly in order to contain the air, what happens to the air quality. But when the money runs out and there's no more public finance in order to operate and to support in the de demolition, you're left with these buildings that are frozen in time and they, they add up and then the costs add up far beyond just the costs, the physical costs, there's the emotional costs and the erasure and the act of violence that just takes and tears down that sends messages of root shock and trauma through 
generation after generation after generation. So it becomes a prescriptive pathology for an inter, this mix of chronic urban problems that seem to become like just hand in hand, physical deterioration, prior poverty and unemployment, physical health issues, environmental issues, uh, but they get, they get tackled in silos and they get tackled from a mathematical lens that's, that starts to devoid away from human and again, ecological realities. So there's a pr process of degeneration. What most people are not paying attention to is the domino effects that subsequently follow. If you tear down and erase our tax base, of the cities and what they designed is there to support the schools. If those housing is not there, if the, if the population not there, then the schools were designed in a domino effect to close. So in Chicago, we lost 49 schools at one swoop and it went up to about 60 schools. And they were all anchored and rooted predominantly on the south and west sides of Chicago, predominantly black, black and brown, predominantly in the most disinvested, systemically disinvested neighborhoods. So again, here we are littered, the population of the, the landscape gets littered with these buildings and remnants that are frozen in time and space. And the materiality of them, they're just searching for relevance. And if they're not economically viable, then they just sit. So what's at question is the neighborhood's education, job, sustainability, and ultimately your future. Now, there are means and mechanisms to support and advance development. So when there is a $2 billion TIF in tax incremental finance that supports and advances five, six, seven billion dollar proposals because it will it, it provides the incentive of new potential development for new capital gain. Uh, when you juxtapose the reality of what was extracted and what was never valued is that in, in Chicago and in, in the same neighborhoods that were erased, $3.2 billion of wealth was lost. It was extracted because of racist real estate practices between 1950 and 1970. But that is just the dollar cost. That's not the generational cost. That's not the mental health costs, that's not the ecological cost. So how, and ultimately, how do you trust? What is the trust? Where is the public trust? So what I'm gonna do is, is a little bit unusual for me. I'm gonna do a, um, I'm reframing the story of Sweetwater and my evolution um, through two buildings that are historic landmarks that are that are recurring themes in my story and in, in, our, in, in our journey in Chicago. Uh, on the left is the Raber House, the John Raber House. It's an Italianate architecture from 1870, uh, predate the fire. Um, the fire didn't actually come as far west or south, but it, it represented a time and era. And then you have the firehouse from 1929 that was, um, that was a relic of the, the city beautiful movement, but the, the, the firehouse was, I mean, the, the Raber house was during the reconstruction era. Um, and you'll see why I'm referring to them shortly, but this is interesting how these buildings, though they were valued at one point and they're still very, they're historical landmarks have not yet found an economic rationality to come back to life. It's about bounded rationalities. So the story of Sweetwater Foundation, um, our tagline is there grows the neighborhood. We operate predominantly on the south side of Chicago, but we have a network, um, national network just growing of value-based partners. Uh, focuses on regenerative neighborhood development, the concept of creating, I mean, the basics, safe, healthy communities and intergenerational um, healthy wealth communities. So through transforming the ecology of once blighted neighborhoods, we operate in what we call the third, third sector in between the public and private sector, uh, where the logos, ethos, and pathos is constantly being restructured. Uh, we operate in a survival mode. 
So 2009 to 2010, I'm going to fly through these. Um, this is important. The only spaces that we were allowed to operate were ironically within the space of education within closed classrooms or classrooms on the brink of closure or even schools on the brink of closure. So when we had uh, resources, just an activation, clear it out, open it up, build the basics of an aquaponic system, hydroponic system, but actually do the building in the school, do the plumbing in the site. Then our teams started to teach and share, and then it was an intergenerational, really, really reciprocal teaching of experiential education that fuses science, technology, engineering, art, architecture, agriculture, mathematics. And the art lives on the walls, the, the life is in the space, the spaces begin to transform, and you can see, you can experience. It defies any form of simple metric. You can see and experience the transformation to the point where the adults, the teachers, the, the parents were also resonating saying, well, I want to learn too. We need to eat too. How do you build this? I can see carpentry, plumbing, and all types of skills in this. 2010, we had the opportunity at Chicago State University, there was an um, opportunity to create a transformation of a shoe warehouse that was closed. Um, it was actually just operating a storage. But between the geography and biology departments that then interface with a multiple different <laughs> transdisciplinary by nature, um, bringing it back to life through, again, through aquaponics, hydroponics. But with, for us, it was really a focus on the heuristic. How do you try and learn by best case scenario? This is 2010, this is early stages before aquaponics was like commonly known. But it wasn't just about the technique of it. It was about the translation and humanizing of the spaces. So we constantly would circle up, we constantly try, we constantly grow. And as the plants are growing, the humans are growing. And then there's a symbiotic nature of reflective kind of interpersonal dynamic that fuses the transformation of life. By 2011, got offered opportunity to High Park Art Center in, in a space that was an extra space it was, uh, they said, hey, you, you could do an art residency here. We have a small space. I said, it's perfect. They were like, it's just an unused space, black, nothing, it's perfect. So I started going to the walls and just started to think through, at the time, thinking through the dissertation and thinking through the questions and reframing discourses of urban decline through urban agriculture, living the dissertation and trying and doing, it was like a mini think do laboratory, but the thing it came to life with people. As humans interface with the plants and the space and the time and the aromas and the smells, the art form did took, took life and it allowed for us to remix and create other form of classroom spaces within other otherwise traditional art spaces. Also defying, don't touch the art. No, we want you to engage the art. We want you to eat the art. We want you to make your own art. You are art, we are all art. So as I was thinking through the designs and the systems through the 2D, 3D spatial, we started to apply for larger recognition and larger support. And in 2012, actually got uh, the National Digital Media and Learning um, recognition with the MacArthur Foundation and a host of others. I think Harvard was um, uh, supporting. And it was like, how do you fuse and do a badge, digital badge-based learning that, that, that transforms the connected learning experience? So our, obviously with aquaponics, it's a no-brainer. You have to design and build it. There's fish, plants, water. How do you do it? So we, we can, we said, like, let's just look at the pathways of learning and experience and the career pathways of water. So water is, if you do hydroponics, you're looking at water chemistry, hydrology, um, plant care, you know, fish habitat, design build, plumbing, carpentry, but it goes through a procession of apprenticeship, junior level, senior level, journeyman, mastery over time. So as we started to refine the models, and refine the means and way of teaching and thinking and growing and infusing uh, Arduino, Raspberry Pis, 
And then nuancing the models, here's two examples that we started to do as displays. Now, the thing about displays is they're shiny, they're nice, they're not messy, but they're not active. When they're, if it's not really active, it's not, if it's too clean, it's not real. It's not, it needs to get a little dirty, but we had the show pieces to activate the imagination. Uh, and the one on the right, uh, the one on the left was Design International Foundation Fighting AIDS. And then the one on the right uh, was a vertical installation we did at the Kennedy King um, City Colleges. And it was with culinary arts and, and STEM classes. So it was introduction to the Kennedy King that in 2013, I got introduced to the firehouse directly across the street at the time, 63rd and Halstead. This is a beautiful building and it was just sitting isolated as a firehouse, it was just frozen. Um, and lo and behold, when you do some research on it, you find out that the architect uh, was the city architect that then designed a number of schools in, in Chicago at the time, and he had an influence on um, some of the manufacturing, some of the window details. So we took our team, took our collective successes and pitched the notion of turning the firehouse into a neighborhood catalyst as an innovation center called the station. Um, we proposed, you know, with the renderings of the essential transformation based off of what we had done, proof of record, proof of concept, but we were told that it was not economically viable. It didn't make economic sense. So um, there was a number of individuals within the city that were excited about us, the potential of us getting the firehouse, but they redirected us to the Raber House. And it was, it was kind of odd. I was like, wow, this is a totally different space, different eras, uh, it's this different degree of decay, um, but why the Raber House? And they were like, it's another historical landmark. It's just been isolated. It's, there's no market value for either. And I said, come again? no market value. How is that possible? Um, and then when I looked it up, it was 1.7 miles away. 1.7 miles away. This is in Inglewood. And it, as you go continue further west, I mean, further east, it goes into Washington Park, but it's still technically in the Inglewood neighborhood. Uh, so lo and behold, after doing a little bit more research, the firehouse and come to find out that the public commissions had funded a 12.2 .12, million dollar contract for two new firehouses. And there was a new firehouse right down the block that from the Raber house that replaced the other firehouse. So there's this really interesting spatial relationship that was just being uncovered and in, the city had said that there was other potential proposals right down the street. So a two minute walk down the street, there was another neighborhood we could just walk through and see, understand. But I wanted to learn a little bit more about the building. So the Raber House, upon, I found a blog, an architecture blog, that they said that a developer wanted to bring it back to life um, as a vineyard. And this was the, rendering, artistic rendering. So what I find interesting in this is this, if this is 1870, who's doing the work? I see a, a gentleman in a top hat. I see wealth. I see a woman with him. I see a, a beautiful promenade. I see this extravagant landscaped, you know, city, beautiful reform movement space, spatially disciplined and regimented with invisible labor, 1870. So I asked some questions of reconstruction. Who was Mr. Raber? Turns out he had 10 acres to himself. And then subsequently over the years, he was just, just it was lost, it was sold and he gained and it was, he left. So around the corner, you have a two acre hole. But when you look a little further, you find this house that was foreclosed, put on the market and, and marketed on a real estate site live like a land baron, like a land baron. And somehow, some way, we found another proposal for the concept of a Raber House Park, returning it back to a 10 acre state, which feels 
very wrong. Streets erased, buildings erased. So this proposal was from, I think it was carried from 2003. There was, you know, was this developer influenced um, the, the, the vision and there was some economic base and rationale for turning this into a park and tourist destinations and what have you to transform the neighborhood. And there was an, an integration, it was a really bizarre combination of a baseball field and a basketball court um, and farming. So 2014, turns out that the Green Healthy Neighborhood Policy was adopted. This, that rendering, series of renderings is highlighted prominently in the Green Healthy Neighborhood Initiative. And the concept across of the, 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 the document is livable, walkable neighborhoods, which makes sense. It is, um, you know, rethinking manufacturing, rethinking parks, recreation, rethinking health and food and wellness, all of that makes sense, but from an abstracted utopia distant way, because the, what was the pathway forward to actually make it manifest? What it, who's doing what? How do you know urban agriculture meets restaurants and production? So subsequently, there was another policy that was enacted where lots were being distributed for it was a large lot program, but it got nicknamed the dollar lot program because you could acquire a lot and a parcel um, for a dollar. Uh, there was you know, economic disclosure statements and parameters of how you could get it. And unfortunately in a poor predominantly black neighborhood, um, the most of the, the individuals who were eligible, who didn't owe money were elders and they did not have the interest or capacity to, to pursue. Um, so it was looking more and more like this logic structure that was bounding the rationality of this site and found it's a mixed bag of manufacturing, commercial, residential, right across, right across in walking distance. It was super interesting. And then there was this figure right across the middle, this rectilinear thing that was the school um, that was erased. So there was a constructed ecology of absence of vacant parcels, percentage owned by the city, percentage owned by absentee, and only 9% owner occupied. It came with a theory of, of change. You have to outreach, you have to talk to people, you have to be on the ground, you create a market basket, you grow some, grow some fruit, do education outreach, pilot program, build a local economy, and repeat, and just try, try, try again. <laughs> so we started to actually bound, put the boundary around it, which is traditional means, but I wanted to look even deeper because there's no way that this happened overnight. This is a black neighborhood, historically black neighborhood in South Side of Chicago that I know, and we knew neighbors that talked about when it used to be white. So, oh, this is the Raber house that's highlighted in the backdrop. Um, so walking through the neighborhood, you see the, 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 the housing stock. Um, Ironically, a lot of it is from 1860 to 1920. Um, again, highlighted is the Raber House. And on the right is a school that used to be there. It was a Mosley School for Social Reform, one of the worst schools in the history of Chicago. That was literally the pipeline to prison. So it made lots of sense that it was erased after being a homeless shelter. It was erased and made, it became a whole. It makes sense, but it doesn't make sense because there's other means in order to do this. So digging further, there was redlining. It's a kind of a no brainer. It's a sad state of affairs, but when you look at how the city was carved and how the neighborhood was carved and dissected, it's the report from the language, from the redlining maps, the tax, the insurance maps, that said this is a virtually 100% Negro occupancy um, and continued influx of Negroes must be contained. Uh, if a neighborhood is to retain its stability, uh, it, it has to be occupied by the same racial and social classes. And it was informed by this mentality that unless various real estate protective associations are strong enough to restrict the colored people, they will spread like the plague. 
This is language taken from April 1st, 1936, from the underwriting manual that informed the value of the housing, of the land, and of our housing market with this fundamentally racist basis. We want white tenants in our community. Um, it's interesting if you go back further, there's a long, long, amazing, amazing, deep, rich conversation about the challenges of the so-called Negro problem and how we're not the problem. So Frederick Douglass summed it up, it's just American people have to be loyal enough to live up to their own constitution. So great migration was the source. This wave of people that felt that they needed to be controlled when you have this influx of African Americans and the influx of other populations, and not to mention the erasure of the native populations that were already here, the architecture and planning profession become complicit in reinforcing these built environment of that are spaces of structures of exclusion and erasure, but it wasn't always like this. The early stages of Chicago in 1895 to 1926, it was a very dense neighborhood. The Sanborn maps show that it was a very, very dense neighborhood. But by 1949, with a reconversion housing project being introduced for coloreds to the neighborhood, blockbustering started to happen and you see the pathway for erasure. So it took a lot of work to go back and revisit and understand the lens of why there was a hole. Why is there a metabolic rift? So we work with the city to say, let's do a farm, community farm. So in the process of introducing the community farm, we named it the community farm because not just an urban farm, it's the community farm, which we were told doesn't make economic sense because we wanted to know what the pounds per acre were. We were not interested in the pounds per acre. I'm interested in social contracts. I'm interested in the human infrastructural development that creates safety, that creates education and inspiration and hope. So when this becomes the new normal, we had to look at the housing that was directly across the street that was marketed to live like a land baron. Again, you can see the Raber house directly in the backyard, literally in the backyard. So we turned the house into a canvas. We opened it up. We said, it's a think-do house. Come, what's a think-do house? Come in, think it, do it, share it, remix it. So as people, put sweat equity and education and jobs were being created. Um, the, the chalkboard paint, whiteboard paint, pictures on the walls, and this, this, this internal transformation that started to, to create this really, really interesting biodynamic feedback loop of humans and nature and, and just people sharing knowledges and sources and then roots and anchors like Mama Betty. Mama Betty from the Great Migration, from Alabama that has knowledge and research. she just has a wealth of information, not formally trained in an academic way, but much, much more, more common sense. Um, so the spaces became flowing with sharing, flowing with art, experience, inspired by nature, doing printing t-shirts, uh, you know, just learning the techniques. And then the new normal before kale was a hot topic, we were doing kale smoothies, we were doing our farm to table, we were doing our markets directly outside, right outside the window. So this actual market created a dynamic for a human interpersonal dynamic and exchange that created a flow of humans and humanity. So by 2015, we started introducing a new aesthetic so created the bench as a public kind of landscape living bench sculpture where the sidewalk was never finished. We created a public art piece that encouraged people to sit by the market and framed the space, framed and invites people to come in. Kids know exactly what to do. They come and run and play on it. The gardens, no fence, becomes an anchor for the neighbors, for their kids, for their grandkids. And next thing you know, we have these schools showing up for field trips to that same house that was foreclosed. Elders observing it, coming in, sharing, sharing that knowledge, sending people, sending neighbors. 
being able to touch broccoli real time and also interface directly with sunflowers and cucumbers and green beans and raspberries created this space of inclusion with intention, not just open doors, with intention. So the ecology of the place was rapidly transforming as well. So the, the, the amount of bees, butterflies, praying mantis, grasshoppers, uh, native bees, which were just as important as the honeybee, native bees, biomimicry, beautiful patterns and designs that inspire a source of life, even hummingbirds. So around this time, I started a public art project working with uh, Lake J, Lake, Lake JFO. Um, and we wanted to do something that reflected on the red line, how ironic, on the red line, this new potential. Um, so we did a public art that reflected there grows the neighborhood, the, the rebirth of the neighborhood through this, this biodynamic feedback and ecosystem. 2015, asked to be in the Chicago Architecture Biennial. Um, we were supporting other entities. We weren't really recognized for the installations, but in SAIC, we did an installation outside design inspired by being outside and doing the design. So we said, let's take the outside, bring it in, inside of a gallery space from the lessons learned from Hyde Park and, and the aquaponics and the classrooms, create a 20 by 20 space for classroom. Um, adding monitoring systems and teaching. And we brought humans in that otherwise had never been downtown, had never been in that space, had never felt welcome. And the, again, the interface of humanity shows up. Uh, at Columbia Ga Glass Curtain Gallage, Galleries, we, we did an installation at the Vacancy Show called Ecologies of Absence. Questioning, why is there so much waste of wood? Why is there so much demolition of the neighborhoods? And why is this? We, so the design was a response to the erasure of the neighborhood. Um, but in the form of a living room, an outdoor space, you know, just pallets, which caused us to go back and find more pallets and create more products. And, you know, this is all the wasted wood. Somehow we have a culture that throws away trees. Every chance you get crates that hold glass for new development or glass or other glass and metal for future bus shelters, stations, whatever, or new, 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 new housing. The wood is discarded. 2016, built more infrastructure, human infrastructure required physical space. The greenhouse becomes a wood shop. So the evolution of the spaces of that used to be houses with urban acupuncture doing an installation that doesn't make any form of economic sense. It makes all the sense in the world. It makes human sense. It makes ecological sense. It makes like, you know, educational sense. So by transforming it into a public workshop to engage and interface. At the same time, there was a lot of discussion about a Whole Foods being opened very close by. And they were like, really a Whole Foods in Inglewood? How's that gonna work with economics? And it, and it was supposed to bring health and fresh access to healthy food and economic opportunities to the South Side. And it was part of a, a, a larger national conversation with Whole Foods about food and food access, um, job opportunities. And lo and behold, it was right next to the firehouse. Six to eight minutes away. So <laughs> that, 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 that fall, I had the opportunity to be a Loeb Fellow at Harvard. And I did a lot of introspection and reflection and thinking. And during the period of uh, that, uh, the change in administration and the pure chaos that was ensuing that was on the, on the horizon, uh, my wife and I wrote a manifesto called We the Publics. Um, and we said, we the people is not working so hot. So we need to figure out another way to think through public education, housing, health, public media, public architecture, public, what is it? And we encourage people to 
contribute to the conversation. So by 2017, we were renewed uh, and came back to a conversation across Washington Park with the Smart Museum of Art. I was asked to do an installation with the team and we started to look at the wasted wood, playing with fire, Shosugi Ban charring before it became again a hot topic, um, but really celebrating the nature of the wood, really celebrating the greens, the materiality, and then restoring the space at the museum and the gallery, but re have an opportunity to restory and rebrand so people weren't thinking of us just as a garden and a farm. Like we're far more than that, we're a neighborhood. We're also looking at forms and potentials of workforce development. So this 17 foot by 40 foot hand drawing, cross-sectional perspective hand drawing with the facade that was rendered off of the wall and a living sculpture bench inspired by our sculptural bench became the, the threshold gallery space to welcome people. What was interesting is again, the humanity, the interface of humanity shows up. And we encourage people to touch the art. So this is a family day. And in the family day, people would show up, bring the families and kids. And then we said, well, we have more scraps. Play with the scraps. We'll make some toys. And you give those to the kids. They know exactly what to do. And then the places were buzzing, alive. And the kids on their own, the young adults, young humans, were thinking and rethinking cities, unprompted. <laughs> I mean, it was just a source of inspiration. So we went back and refined and said, let's, let's, we had a, um, an inner interface with Grisdale Arts in Ireland. Um, I mean, while we were in Ireland at the Ireland Museum of Modern Art, and we shared uh, an interface of a design, we, we now call them fractals, uh, but it was a crate. That's another crate that you can modify into some stackable modular design, uh, teaching high schoolers and and everyone of all ages, how to draw it, do the 3D model, creating a workshop. Again, in the gallery space, in our art installation, creating a space of, for teaching with teachers, principals, uh, adults, parents, bringing them back to interface with us. Finding new recruits for our apprenticeship program, finding new recruits for our mentor program thinking about better ways to teach, but using this discarded wood as the best malleable source and access in order to teach an instrument, creating products. So then of course you have the hexagons, triangles, and it's a great way to teach, you know, Pythagorean theories. Like it's just, it's just a great way to teach how to draw, how to think, how to visualize and have a product. So as we created products, it was not uncommon that we would leave our product in public space to claim space, to beautify the space with intention and love. 2017, we also got uh, support from Art Place America to design a barn, because why not? We have to question what's the typology of a barn in an urban agriculture in, a, in the south side of Chicago. So partnering with an international woodworking guild, we co-designed and built hand-raised, hand-raised, a uh, timber frame structure in the shape of a barn and a pavilion. 2018, life. So it becomes a destination point. It becomes an interface. It becomes a pavilion. It becomes this active space that we celebrated Juneteenth. We celebrate celebrations of freedom, claiming the street, claiming play, claiming education to, you know, just bringing people together through Again, not an economic rationality. This is a human and ecological, it just makes sense. It's just, that's the form of basis of our rationality. Celebrating culture, not trivializing culture, not parasiting on culture, bringing folks together to share, to be lost in space and just to be, to relax, to re-up, to recharge. 2019, again, more celebrations, more people showing up, 
more impromptu art, performance, dance, African still, West African still walking in the barn on the south side of Chicago in Inglewood, Washington Park during Juneteenth. Can't make it up. The sunflowers are so prolific that you can't even see the lacinato kale, the collards. The sunflowers just take you into a dream space. And then as it got colder, we had to create a design inside to enclose and capture the, and so learning the lessons from the greenhouse, capturing the heat and then creating a space again with reclaimed wood for puppeteers. It's a marionette, it's, it's, it's unbelievable artists that show up, bringing the kids, bringing this imagination, bringing people together. This was a workshop we did with the Graham Foundation and Tatiana Bogao, thinking about the interstitia beyond the grid, interstitial spaces beyond the grid and disrupting the grid with an intentionality to rethink and dream in a liminal space. Same year, fall architecture biennial, we had to claim more space by beautifying where there's too much grass, we mowed it, we created a Pasadian platform, created an installation that was a smaller scale pavilion reflecting housing right across the street for the neighborhood, for people to come and interface to use in public. It's a public sculpture, it's a public space, there's no fence, come and engage. So when we shift and transformed it back into the installation at the cultural center, we had to rethink and redesign because the community came back and said, where did our space go? Where's our building? So we designed what we called the meeting house, but by using more accessible materials, lost, you know, reclaimed wood, same charring technique, hand raising, working with the residents to remember and celebrate life. This is one of our uh, celebrations of life memorial sessions. Uh, when we lost one of our extended uh, team network. Um, but it was interesting watching this space take shape on a place that used to be houses that were then torn down. This pavilion comes up as the meeting house. Before it was a meeting house, it was just a place to meet. So it became the meeting house, space for education, play and dreaming and teaching and learning. So right around this time, 2019, there was Invest Southwest is an opportunity for bringing infusions of capital of dollars um, into neighborhoods that have been historically disinvested. But the methodology was such that it was data driven. It was much more around um, uh, commercial corridors and um, we didn't fit, we didn't register within the parameters of the methodology. So when you get a $250 million boost with the potential of transforming public space, 2020, we were just doing it. Um, and then here we go, we, COVID pandemic hits the world. Um, and everyone is quarantined, but as an, as an essential business in agriculture and also doing education, we continued. So we provided seedlings, we provided space, we provided, provided necessary space for gathering, safe space for gathering, for being outdoors, feeding. So we had, we just rehearsed our future. We, we didn't realize we had been rehearsing our future the whole time. Uh, so we masked up, social distance, continued our education, continued our apprenticeship, continued our mentorship, continued making proje projects, um, teaching, sharing, new products, better education, in public space, outdoors, attracting more community, bringing more people together, creating a social distance market space on formerly vacant properties that was now public space. Public cooking demonstrations, public market. Again, this doesn't somehow make economic sense, but we have social entrepreneurs that are beekeepers, that are ecopreneurs, that that's where they thrive. So this space was perfect for Big Mike, who makes canes out of refound, you know, 
uh, branches, found objects, found wood, you know, makes objects. So we had a time to be thinking and refining our water collection, our solar usage. How do you put a sump pump uh, tied to a solar panels with the water capture? Um, still cultivating our potatoes, farms taking shape, just as periods of abundance. And it was absolutely beautiful. As we were thinking about how to reactivate the reconstruction house directly across the street through memory and remembering, we transformed the space that was in, in desperate need of attention. It was from 1891. Uh, we transformed the space into a gallery for the neighborhood. Uh, so we wanted to figure out how to reactivate it. So we started to select I, uh, um, residents who had trouble getting into other galleries because of race, class, age-ism. Um, and we created memory sessions and re remembering sessions, cooking demonstrations, live streamed them. So the reconstruction house became a hum for humans and residents. So 2021, we acquired the church directly next to the Raper house. Well, actually, our neighbor who's been there for 50 plus years is right between, and she remembers when that church, a historic black church in the neighborhood was the anchor and root for the neighborhood. And when it started to become lost and forgotten because of the loss of population and ultimately the game of real estate. So we acquired the property and we're actively remembering, trying to understand how envision and collectively vision a new civic arts church. What, what is civic in the 21st century? What is art? What is a church? And how do we restore it? But having an indoor outdoor space while we continue our education. So as we we're talking with the city, we're coming up with new projects. We're actively, this is all in the winter, creating new products, creating new spaces, uh, refining the techniques using Japanese saws, uh, chisels. And now we're back to creating workshops with our neighbors and networks that are more and more hopeful than ever before. Um, COVID has is done this, it's like horrific damage to uh, our families, but it also has refined the focus and brought so many people together. So while we create our CNC um, signage for the farm with new apprentices, we've been harvesting all winter long this is current and we're at the Commonwealth. Welcome to the Commonwealth. This is our 14 acre spread in the neighborhood across four contiguous city blocks with the Commonwealth, the Academy, the arts, the marketplace. Our values, our core values, regeneration, small is beautiful, chaord, chaotic, balance of chaos and order, Sankofa, reach back to be present to move forward seventh generation principle, knowing that our responsibility is seven generations ahead. This is not new. And as much as possible, open source to share across the network so that we can all refine across our value-based partners. So this is what that, this is what that looks like. It's a 14 acres spread across four contiguous blocks, but it's not legible. It's not a shiny object. So just this past month, um, it was announced that the, this new eco food hub is being introduced um, to Inglewood 13 years later, I'm sorry, eight years later from 2013, when we first started to ask about the firehouse. Now it looks like there's a proposal um, with a different rationality. Similar words, similar approaches, but just different economic rationality. Um, so for us, I think we're at a critical crossroads uh, to redefine what the structures of our consciousness are and what type of society we really wanna live in. So it's time for a paradigm shift. Um, so we're, cre we're hosting a lot of Sankofa Living Memory Series, Food is Medicine, History that's living history with us. Uh, and in that process, we discovered the rural school 
So Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver, uh, and the Department of Education, the State Department of Education, with Tuskegee's Division of Architecture, uh, Agriculture, and Mechanical Industries, like created a model in 1915 of what education and vocations, trades, and community could and should be with a flexible house space. This was just completely missed and overlooked. It was known as the, Ro Ro the Rosenwald Schools, but it was Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver that combined with their network to design a series of rural schoolhouses that were the anchor and root of a community. And it was about an eight to 10 acre, 14 acre site that they said, this is what our community needs. So here we are. Um, Southside Chicago with just a different lens, just a different take on life. So it is the picture of life. I'm gonna use this, this quote from uh, Frederick Douglass that I, 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 it resonates with me. It's the picture of life contrasted with the facts of life. The ideal contrasted with the real that makes criticism possible. Where there is no criticism, there is no progress. Uh, and Grace Lee Boggs sums it up. These are the times to grow our souls. Each of us is called to embrace the conviction that despite the powers and principalities bent on commodifying all of our human relationships, we have the power within to create the world anew through unbounded possibilities beyond bounded rationalities. There grows a neighborhood. Casey. I'm coming back. Yeah. Um, thank you for that amazing talk. I, I, um, it, it's astounding to me how many issues you cover in such a tight time frame. Um, and, and partially because you, um, you managed to come up with a lot of solutions, right? You identify problems, but you also, figure out human solutions for addressing them, right? And your, your sort of whole approach seems very antithetical to the way in which our society is organized. So you started the, the conversation today with the, the question about how you rebuild trust, right? right? And, and I think that you've done an amazing job of it um, at, you know, and, and have documented it for us today. Um, the, the question I would ask is how, how does the system of governance manage to rebuild trust? I mean, the, the, the example that you showed of the, of the uh, SOM project um, uh, over by the firehouse is, is an example of the, the city governance trying to um, energize a portion of the neighborhood and create new amenities there. Sure. And, and it's, it's economically driven, right? It, sure. it's, not, uh, it's not like your effort, which is, is humanistic and, and you know, uh, I would argue is based on human currency, right? And investing in people. Mm -hmm. So is, how do you bridge that divide? How do you, how do you scale it up? It, it, so it's kind of a no brainer, actually. It's, it, it's just being present and actually being in the space. And what you had the opportunity when you came by, when you physically are able to show up or we create means for people to begin to be heard, be listened, and just create a, a, just a, this dynamic of exchange of ideas um, and be willing to embrace accountability. I think that's part of one of the challenges that we have yeah. with our systems and systemic processes of neglect and um, disinvestment 
it there has been uh, an unwillingness for accountability for far too long. And there have not been structures for accountability. So it makes no sense that we should do all of this extra work. And it gets taken for granted when it would benefit both and both systems, yeah. both sides would benefit tremendously uh, by just finding a way to come together. And, 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 and okay, you see issues, issues of scaling up, the waste stream um, is not, it's not uncommon. Uh, the, the human infrastructure waste stream, the physical waste stream, the material waste stream, it's, it's embedded across industries, across cities, across the, the nation, across the planet. Um, it, it automatically is scaled. There's people doing this all over the place. It's just creating the right interface to gain support and not just keep doing um, the same thing over and over again. I, you know, one would, one would argue that there's a definition for that. I won't say what that is. I, well, it, it, it does seem like you would, uh, you'd need to change your investment model, right? You, you'd need to invest in neighborhood initiatives and not in, you know, big development projects, right? Again, there's a both and so there's, a, there's a physical infrastructure that needs to be supported. There has to be, if you're going to be dealing with water and lead in the water, um, this crisis of lead in the soil, crisis of just neglect, it, it warrants the investment in the physical infrastructure, but mm -hmm. it also warrants that you're reaching out and supporting education, you're reaching out and supporting um, the local. Uh, and unfortunately, there seems to be these timescales that don't, that don't mix. The timescale of the particular pathway of development that has a shorter, shorter return, short, faster path um, is inherently at odds in almost an irreconcilable way that ironically costs more. It costs more to do these same patterns of development when it would be extremely economic and beneficial with a different parameter of time scale over. Right. It just, it would make more sense. But when it's in, when it's driven by numbers of jobs, numbers of returns, numbers of this within a 18 to 36 month window, it renders it impossible. Yeah. So uh, touching on that somewhat, um, and I want to encourage everybody who's listening to put their questions into the chat. Um, we have a question from Miguel that asks um, if you could expand on how projects get funded and how they manage to financially operate, right? So w one thing you're, you're saying is that we have to we have to set up a different mechanism for evaluating success, right? We need to look at a longer time frame. We need to look at a broader range of outcomes than just financial success. But how do you how do you get that initial investment to move forward? Um, what's interesting is that we've demonstrated time and time again, and this is this needs to change that we can do more with less. Um, we have fundamentally transformed um, spaces that have otherwise been empty for 20 plus years. Um, small scale investments, small in lawnmowers. <laughs> Weed whackers training and talking about how to use and operate the machinery, how to care for it. Uh, and actually just being a neighbor where somebody says, hey, can I use your lawnmower? We say, sure, bring it back in trust. And then just those human infrastructure moments that create a much more resonant feedback. So we've had folks that say, you know, I actually, I can go make a little side job um, 
and it seems insignificant or trivial to some, but it's huge, where there be, there's this radiating pulse that comes that spreads out and comes back, and it it it, it, it there's a beautifying effect. There's a uh, it. it by just the sheer act of doing it and with a local regularity and frequency, um, it is so has such such a larger impact than it's just quantifiably measurable. Yeah. So I think what happens is, and you experience it when you come by and you say, "Wow, there's a, a degree of intention on each and every step that's connected, and it has its own logic structure." um yeah. that unfortunately unless you're local and we we prioritize local we don't prioritize outside of that that's it, out, of, out of the geographic boundary for the needs of the local which sometimes unfortunately are at odds with how the system wants things to operate right yeah i it, one of the other things that I think your presentation highlights is just how few spaces there are for meaningful human exchange in our society, right? That one of the things that's that I think is amazing about the Sweetwater Foundation and the Commonwealth is that that it's a place where you can just go and engage in common activity with other people. You can learn how to make things. You can learn how to grow things. You can um, see artists perform. There, there are relatively few um, equivalents that I can think of in in other neighborhoods, right? And mm -hmm. and even you point out that that uh, that that project uh, proposed project over um, by the firehouse. Um, which they're they're calling you know the Inglewood living room, right. right? Is is unlikely to be activated in the same way, unless there's very careful programming of it by someone who you know shares that value. Um, yeah, I mean that that space will be uh, controlled very differently. Uh, yeah. like very differently it will it it, it 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 will be very much programmed for specific types of programming um especially if it's a business interaction if it's a uh, educational it's if it it it, ha it will want to have a certain look and feel um and i was also looking at some of the comments where going back to this issue of funding right um Gardening, th there are lots of individuals or groups or organizations being funded to do gardens, but without the human infrastructure, without the actual regularity, frequency, and support or water infrastructure, a lot of these gardens that are being funded, um, just from checking the box numbers, don't have the support to be, um, to flourish. And without the human infrastructure, without the education, without the actual physical water infrastructure, um, so they, they don't they don't flourish the same way. So while there are mechanisms that are happening, and it is the right thing to do to support gardens and farms um, in the city, you really have to critically ask what human infrastructure support, what education is supported, what that should be funded. It's not about funding the thing. It's not about funding the 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 number and quantity of all of them. It, right. it's, yeah, it's, yeah. No, I I think that makes sense. I mean, one of the things that uh, you know that we talked about when uh, I came down was um, the the fact that the the site that the barn is on, which is kind of the largest uh, piece of land, right? Contig acres, contiguous yeah. piece of land. Yeah, right. um, doesn't actually have city water right. right so so you had to invent mechanisms to harvest both uh water and energy from the environment to be able to properly operate that as a farm right right, right. 
yeah and and, and it, would, it would take very small support um to to shift that trajectory quickly um it just it, it it's it, the the interface has just not been there yet right right but also you have you have the skills to be able to create that right not not every not every community would necessarily have someone architecturally trained who right. would would know how to you know put all of the component parts together that that need to occur absolutely in order to create that that harvester right I mean, it's the beauty of a butterfly roof design you yeah. know uh, and but what's nice also is a great opportunity for the workshop so that's what we've been working and you know we'll so we'll do the installation we'll create it as a public installation that will then attract people and then we can create this this dynamic of a workshop but it's it's just going back to the earlier question is like there are so many opportunities with such basic small support were they extended that would also begin to allow people to see and shape and change the trajectory of the rationality. I mean, there's, there's there's so many other solutions. It's like we create a contrapositive framework, an if then scenario that shows and exposes the variability of the formula. The formula does not have to be the same thing every single time. And unfortunately, there are there are select models that just make sense according to the paper or the vision or the rendering that seem to make sense, but when you actually get into the equation of it, they don't make actual sense. Right. Right. I want to go to some of the questions that have come in. Um, okay. Billy Chin asks, is there a way of transforming wealthier established communities to modify their behaviors through your efforts? Wealthier? Interesting. Um, what one might argue that it has already it's been happening. We have folks that come in and interface with other humans, and we have a lot of people that are too scared to show up to our neighborhood. Um, and people are showing up, but it's how much are you willing to also not just show up and just continue the conversation. So we have some right. folks that are uh, that are modifying the nature of their spaces in their in their neighborhoods and also the structure of their relationships with friends. So when they've offered and extended um, to come and participate either in our market to share funds, but also to have a good time with people, um, some of their some of the friends said that they wouldn't go yeah. so it created a dynamic between the friendship and they restructured their friendships so it it is it is taking shape um it is having effect but again it's just the, it's the frequency of how people are are starting to bridge those gaps just spatially uh, right. you know prime example hyde park there's so many people that went from hyde park that then um would just go two miles to cross into Washington Park or Inglewood and then realize through the family days that there's a network of friends that didn't realize they even knew each other. Yeah, yeah. I, for those uh, listening who aren't from Chicago, Hyde Park is the neighborhood in and around the University of Chicago, um, which is a, a more affluent neighborhood than Inglewood or Washington Park. Um, I, I'm also curious, though, in that question about, you know, you point out in the beginning that um, Chicago is in many ways a very segregated city, right? There, there's so. great wealth to the north and in the south and west, less, you know, less access to resources. Um, do, do you think that these principles are exportable to communities on the on the north side? Oh, absolutely. They a hundred percent. I mean, uh, this is not, this is, this is, this is a human basis and it's actually 
ecologically driven. I mean, small scale installations where there's more density. Um, we have from just a gardening farming, like that's easy. Um, the materials that people, I mean, actually the DIY culture has just taken off during yeah. COVID. I mean, yeah. so actually we found um, a lot more people that are showing up more recently for a volunteer day or just to just to get out um, to experience a different side of the city. And the what we're finding is that the techniques of just using the drills and the commonplace techniques of the miter saw or the table saw um, are creating interfaces for conversations with people to say, oh, well, I, do, I can do that too. And I have a smaller space or I have, I have an, a, a space that I need help with. Um, so it, it, is, it is absolutely taking shape right now. So one of the things that um, comes out in your presentation is, is the kind of incremental growth of, of the community, the Commonwealth. Um, what, what do you see as the next iteration? What, what's, the, what's the next thing that, that builds on what you've been doing that adds to the robustness of the community? So, um after we reactivate uh, the church and bring that new life mm -hmm. in, in creating a space that's an indoor outdoor civic arts type of space um, the next step of the graduated incrementalism for us because it's 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 not just incrementalism just to be incremental Right. There's, no, a, no. there's yeah. a trajectory for yeah. the graduated incrementalism of it is is doing social economies so doing some of the more more nuanced manufacturing because we have to build a, a manufacturing site. Um, but since there is a space that's zoned for manufacturing, it would make sense to do something on that space to have an extension of not just a community workshop. The community workshop is more about education. If you're actually doing something spaces for production, you can't only do education and it doesn't work that well. You have to create a space and flow for the manufacturing and production of the community scale production and it has its own rhythm and space. So we're looking at the local community scale production of the products because there's enough of a quote unquote market. People are asking mm -hmm. all the time for the forms of products or they just like, they want to be part and they want to support. Um, that moves away from just philanthropic, you know, givings. Um, there's requests for products all the time, but then the transition into actually doing, getting support for some of the housing. So there's so much housing that needs to be restored and should be restored before it's torn down. So just the, the opportunity of doing um, deconstruction not demolition or salvaging mm -hmm. and then restoring houses that that have life they're just frozen and just neglected they have life what's nice is that it's the same conversation to folks in detroit it's the same conversation yeah. to people in baltimore it's the same conversation in pittsburgh um, charleston south carolina and we have a network of a value-based partner network that is already across about, uh, uh, we have 12 cities consistently, Boston, Chicago, um, Detroit, that we're sharing on a regular basis of how, what is the local adaptive response that is similar mm -hmm. and it is different, but it's also reconceptually re reconceptualizing these empty spaces as green spaces and parks at a small scale, at a local scale. And it's absolutely translatable. So we've been sharing methods and techniques already about how to, you know, claim and trans transform a space, but at an appropriate scale in time and space. Right there, um, you you uh, touched on a couple of things there. One of the things um, was housing, right? About uh, potentially adding housing. Are there models within that network um, that that provide potentially a direction for you in terms of the housing, or is it something that that you think you're going to have to invent that is site specific? 
Um, I mean, there are 20th century models of, of like land trusts um, that need a, a 21st century update twist um, that embrace forms of production and, and uh, technology that are pretty solidly grounded models in terms of stabilization, mm -hmm. but they need to have some form of, again, that's a kind of an economic output that also supports the, the generation of capital to support the, the flows of, of, of sustain the, the neighborhood. Um, there are a lot of examples of housing. Unfortunately, a lot of them are not within the US. Um, it's just a different social structure or governance structure right. that have supported housing, affordable housing, um, that, that it, it is directly supported by um, the government. Um, so there are models. Uh, it's going to have take a, a 21st century solutionary twist. Uh, but yeah. We had a question uh, come in about zoning, right? And I know that um, uh, it's one of the things you just touched on about manufacturing and introducing it into the neighborhood. Um, the fact that there are already sites that are um, uh, zoned for that use. I, you also touch on in the beginning that zoning helped to create the conditions that exist on the south side. Can, can you talk about um, those two factors and, and sort of what your sure. feeling is? I mean, would, would you be better positioned to have a, a you know, no zoning in the neighborhood or to be able to kind of have community driven zoning as opposed to city driven zoning? Well, I mean, so even if you look at the way that the the, the four or five blocks is carved about um, manufacturing, but it's an interesting, it's only like 125, 140 foot space that runs along a stretch that's by where the rail line would come by. So the railroad, um, the, the rail that was the source of jobs at one point went away. Right. And then the function stayed zoning for manufacturing, even though the businesses that were directly tied to rails were gone. And so since uh, probably since 1972, three, there has not been a local manufacturing on that site um, for quite some time. And then the definitions of what was being manufacturing, how is being manufactured uh, have completely changed in the past three decades, completely transformed. Um, the one, one would, you could easily argue that the, the traditional density model of housing in this neighborhood that has lost as much population it has in in, in in short amount of time in 40 years we lost like 40 40 to 50 to 60 percent of the population um maybe it makes more sense not to redensify and carve out the parcels parcel after parcel after parcel actually leave some of the space for these interstitial spaces make and allow for smaller footprints of housing because there's a lot of elders that want smaller space. There's also a lot of folks that want smaller housing um, and the housing, smaller housing is on trend. So if you could actually manufacture housing in that footprint and have space for learning from it and habituating the learning process from it, then zoning would evolve concurrently. And it become, almost becomes a, like a library of possibilities for how zoning and the city and governments and universities and the local could actually work yeah. together. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it allows you to kind of expand that network, right? By bringing all of those different partners to the table. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was wild. Like we've had people that come in from, they have never, from India that have never been in Chicago. Uh, we have folks from we have uh, one one student is coming in from from Lagos um, and then to have the interface uh, of someone in Inglewood who has not traveled um, yeah. is everything 
I mean, it's everything. And then having somebody who just graduated master's thesis in architecture and they, they think they know, but then they realize they know some things, there's a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, but it grounds, it, it levels the playing field and grounds it on such a, such a, such a foundational way that the, 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 the monetary support um, with the consistency over, sustained over time, it, 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 it lasts longer, goes further, and it, and it just it works. So focusing on the neighborhood and this idea of exchange, w one of the questions that came in um, uh, from the audience is a question about the South Side, right? Do, do you think that the South Side, uh, not to kind of romanticize it, but do you think that the South Side is experiencing um, uh, a renaissance of sorts, right? That, that there is a, is a group of uh, kind of committed, interesting, creative thought leaders that, that are making transformational change there? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a necessity and urgency that it has to, it has to happen. Um, it has to happen. So it is, it is, it is a necessary response to a system that it's just been so, so long for neglected and erased um, that it has to happen. And what, what is nice is that there are the right network is a balance in an arise of thought leaders that are opening up the spaces for the possibility for things to happen. And because of the absolute um, insanity of the system where it has reached a point, I mean, our, our, our recent year of, of historical events has exposed so much that honestly is not, it's nothing new to those that live or work right. here. It's just, it's now the conversation is afoot. The challenge and risk is that the narrative becomes the thing that gets accelerated and not the actual manifestations of change. Right. So the, 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 that's, the, that's the precarious nature of where we're at. So um, we have another question from the group um, uh, sort of getting down to uh, to sort of brass tacks about your operation. How large a team comprises Sweetwater? So um, we've actually learned how to handle that very well. Um, there's a core team. Our core team stays within the powers of 10. Um, and I mean that uh, and you get the architectural reference on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it stays at the powers of 10 because there's a really, really nice dynamic of 10 feet, 100 feet, 1,000 feet. Um, but how, how much can be done with the core group of 10, a core team? To, so we have elders, we have um, folks 65 and under uh, that go to about uh, 19 as a part of the core team. Uh -huh. um, we have local level apprentices that come in as they're able, when I say that in a local level apprentices that have a localized experience with police or education or institution systems, incarceration, whatever, you know, that's a localized experience. It's not just because it's a media geography of local, it's a local. Right. So we have waves of, um, and this is pre COVID versus now, this is a whole different thing. Um, we would have a group of eight consistent that we would have an interf interface with um, six to eight, either through Chicago Housing Authority, through uh, various Chicago public schools, other partners, local area partners. As you get closer to spring and summer, the more hands you need. As we found more support from existing, you know, there's existing mechanisms that support jobs. Um, that 
like a one summer Chicago. There's enough, there's support for youth to have paid jobs and they're looking for organizations and institutions in order to support and provide the jobs. So we were able, we were able to grow our team accordingly with partners that have other forms of funding and capital. Then we can, we, we find folks that are, they're able to stay with us. And that, that's a complex thing in and of itself. The ones that can stay, stay. And then we refine our team. And then it's just, it's just, just growing and swelling based on the needs and capacity per se, for the season. So um, I think that answers Joy Heck's question as well. Um, and I see Anne has joined us, which is probably an indication that um, she she needs to make some closing remarks. Uh, Emmanuel, I want to thank you for this conversation. I hope we get a chance to continue it. Um, and I hope that uh, the audience, um, there were some questions that weren't answered. And I hope we have the ability to kind of get them uh, responses before. Uh, no, absolutely. I, I know yeah. it was, it's interesting because both of us were monitoring the yeah. chat. It's <laughs> trying such to. such an interesting yeah. space. Um, I, I can, I'll happily send some of the other additional responses. And I do want to respond. It's not that we're not eligible for um, invest Southwest or what have you, which we, we, there's different approaches, strategy, strategies and approaches towards outcomes. Um, and in the previous administration, we were told that we're not economic development. Mm. And it was a different mentality, different, but you know, there's hope that it will change. So I'd, I'd like to both repeat and multiply Casey's thanks. This has been, I mean, we've been talking about this presentation for a, a long time and we're so pleased that it was realized. I think there are a lot of outstanding questions and I think that we will find a way to continue the conversation in another format. You're not off the hook yet. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, for those of you who need CEUs, that instruction was um, put off to the side. Um, and that was just um, a truly memorable presentation. So thank you very much to both of you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And Casey, thank you. this is the long start. It's just- <laughs> I like that. Let us know how I we like can that. You know, book our visits when we come to Chicago too. You just reach out. We're, we we ain't got no walls. <laughs> just in the it's like you could just show up. Um, you know. Super. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Sam.